Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Amanda. Uh, this is Milo, my son's service dog. He is a border collie. I have a video up on the channel um, all about him and how what tasks he does as an autistic service dog. I think in that video we said he was an Aussie doodle, but this last Christmas, because that's what we were told when we bought him, he was a rescue dog. Um, but this last Christmas, we did one of the DNA tests and we found out that he is actually a Border Collie uh, poodle mix. And he also has Pyramese Mountain Dog and um, a few other different breeds mixed in. But his two main ones were Border Collie, which tracks because he's so freaking smart, and Poodle, um, which is also another smart breed. Anyway, so I will link the video about Milo here. But today's video, I really wanted to talk about social constructs. That has been the topic that has been on my mind the last couple of days. And I do have two other videos on the channel about social constructs too. And one of the reasons why I think the topic has just been on my mind a lot. I mean, so, Let's start over. What is a social construct? A social construct is basically something that we as humans made up to, you know, have when we have language and we're coming together as a society to make things work together as a group of people, we have to create things for people to work in harmony together. And so we created things out of language. But what will happen is over time, these things sometimes get bogged down. They don't necessarily serve us anymore, but people forget that humans made them up. And for some reason that I don't understand, autistic people are more likely to see and understand that social constructs are made up and that we can make something else up. And allistic people really get stuck, and allistic is a non-autistic person, get stuck in the thinking of like, well, this is how it's always done. This is just how it is. We can't change it, or it's too hard to change it. And these kinds of things, which drives autistic people absolutely bonkers because we get stuck in the social justice aspect of it. Um, because social... Justice is often another autistic trait. So specifically, and, and so some examples of social constructs are time. You know, we made up how we were going to divide time. Um, one thing that is kind of really frustrating, and I get, none of these things are easy to change. I'm not arguing that, but <laughs> it's like, if somehow we could create a change around them, yes, Milo, I'm talking. Um, it would just make things like so much easier. And so the fact that, you know, one month of the year has 28 days most of the time, but other months have 30 or 31, when you we could divide it into 13 months, with 28 days each, which would be a much more easy division. There would still be a leap day, but it would be much more even than the current system. Now, is that one worth changing? I don't know, but it's just an example. There is the, so a gender is a social construct. Um, you know, biologically we have, <laughs> Well, even biological, there isn't just male and female because there are lots of humans and other animals that are born with a mix of chromosomes that chromosomes that have different scientific names other than just straight female or male sex. And I'm not going to get into the science of that, but gender itself is a social construct and how gender presents in a society is a social construct. And what I mean by that is, you know, there were, there was a time when pink was a boy color 
but now pink is associated with a girl color. We just made that up. Pink is not a gender, right? But we associate it in our society with a gender. And, you know, people will get really upset if they see in like the US, and it's getting better, if they see a male person wearing a skirt, but in other cultures, men wear, you know, dress type shaped outfits or kilts, and it's perfectly normal. It's because we made up a social construct in the United States that women wear dresses and men don't, but we made it up. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, money, something we made up. Governments, we made up. Country borders, completely made up. Um, tipping culture is another one that drives me insane. And it has gotten completely out of hand in the United States. Other countries don't tip. But if you start to talk to an American about how tipping is broken, and you're talking to an allistic person, they're like, but the servers don't get paid enough. You have to tip. And I'm like, so pay the servers more. And they're like, oh, but it's too hard. The corporations and the, the corporate people and the higher ups don't want to make that change. And I'm like, yeah, because they benefit from this broken system. Of course, they're not going to want to change. So, and that's, that's the crux of a lot of the social change. Somebody is benefiting from keeping the broken system. And one of the reasons why this whole topic has been on my brain a lot the last couple of days is because today I had my kids IEP meeting and that stands for an individualized education plan. So I homeschooled from my kids from pre-K till eighth grade and now they are doing an online um, public school. And so I'm learning all about the IEPs, you know, which is the US version of accommodations for disabled children. And my kids are also autistic ADHD. And last year's IEP meeting was their first one ever because again, you know, homeschooling. And so I had to learn all about the language of the IEP and realize, like learn how, how much of it is red tape. And it's just, it's infuriating. And the public school system is another social construct we made up on a way to educate our children, you know, in our society. And it's so broken right now, but people will acknowledge that it's broken, but it's like sometimes, some people don't acknowledge that the system is broken, but nobody, you know, feels, they feel powerless to make changes. And COVID has shown that, you know, the code response shows that if the right motivation is there, the governments and people can make quick changes. It, it is possible, but again, there are people who benefit from it not changing, so it doesn't change. And being able to homeschool was a way to opt out of the social construct of the public school system. Um, unfortunately, you know, Homeschooling isn't accessible to all families across the United States, and I don't even know about other countries. It worked out so great for us, and I wish we could continue, but for a lot of various reasons, some to do with my personal health and just a bunch of things, we weren't able to, so we did have to rely on the public school system, again, because you know there's a law of compulsory education in the United States, and... Um, that's all well and done, good, except for the fact that, you know, we have to follow this law and put them in a system that's broken and is not made for autistic brains. Even the special education pro um, departments aren't often made for the specific disability of autism. Um, we had to fight for our IEP last year because my kids were making good grades and they're like, they don't need IEP. And I'm like, you don't understand. My kids get this A because they are spending three, four hours 
on this assignment because they have executive dysfunctioning, they have anxiety, they have they don't understand the assignment correctly, so they have to get more information from the teacher. Um, a neurotypical student gets this assignment and completes it in 30 minutes. My kids are spending triple, quadruple the amount of time on that to get that grade, and that is not equitable. Like, they need the IP because they do have a disability, and just because their grades show that they can may get an A, they should not have to spend triple the amount of time on their schoolwork as a neurotypical student. That's just not fair. That's not equitable. And so we finally got the department to see that most of the autistic kids that they service um, have comorbidities of learning disabilities or um, speech delays or other, you know, like I said, other comorbidities that are the reason why they're getting their IEP. And my kids just need the accommodations of, they need explicit instruction on their assignments. They don't do well with open-ended um, questions. They, when they get a multiple choice question, they can, sometimes there's an obvious one that's wrong, but then they have some where it's like, they can logic their way into why each of these answers are correct. Multiple choice questions trick their brains. Their brains are not set up for multiple choice questions, but they can, you know, verbally tell you probably more than a lot of the other students. Um, you get them talking about the things that they've learned. They have so much knowledge. They just don't test well. Testing and autism for a lot of autistic people, again, Autism spectrum, I'm sure there's some autistic people who love taking tests because their brains have figured out how to take the test. Again, because my kids were homeschooled and we didn't, we did everything verbally. Uh, I mean, they did a handwritten work too, don't get me wrong. But like for me to test their knowledge was all pretty much verbal. They never took tests. And so to be thrown in on how to take a test, that was just not a skill that they ever learned. And it's kind of stupid that, you know, kids learn how to take a test instead of, being tested on their actual knowledge, kids are passing because they know how to figure out how to manipulate the test answers. Um, anyway, back to social constructs. So I was all, I myself feeling extremely anxious about this IEP meeting because it's very important, but it's, it's hard because I also know how incredibly, um, broken the system is and like the things that we need my, for my kids IP, the school actually can't really provide in a way that's meaningful because broken system there, the teachers are too overworked to give an actual individualized education plan. Like that's the goal, but they can't really do that. They don't have enough time and the teachers are doing their hardest. Like I'm not blaming the teachers. That's another thing that when you start talking about social constructs with allistic people, they will start talking about, you know, the teachers or as far as the tipping, they're like, oh, but, but the waiters. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not talking about the teachers. I'm not talking about the waiters who get tips. I'm talking about the system. Let's like, let's go up. I can see um, in my video where I talk about bottom down, bottom, bottom down thinking versus top up thinking. Am I saying that right? Um, Autistic people, we see the big picture a lot more um, and then we can like break it down. And so the teachers themselves are doing the best they can in a broken system, but their system is so broken. And these IEP plans are like, oh wow, if the system wasn't broken, this would be great. You know, they could create a test that works for this actual student. But in reality, they can't actually do that, but they have to put it in on paper that they can. So it's like this red tape. And so like one of the accommodations was for the teachers to provide a concrete example of the type of work that the kids are expected. So if it was going to be an essay test, or I mean an essay for like 
writing class, for instance, give them a completed essay so they can see how it needs to be formatted, how many citations they need, how many paragraphs, like give them an example. And so in the IEP, they put where possible. So the teachers can be like, oh, well, it just wasn't possible for me to provide an example for this student. And so it gives the teachers a loophole to not have to fulfill on um, their IEP because it's a legal document and we can technically hold them to it. Um, except again, the system is broken. Anyway, so I had so much anxiety the last couple of days because I knew this IEP meeting is coming up and I'm trying to advocate for my kids to have the best education that they can and just trying to find the right wording because it's like you have to lock in to the language that they can work with and they have to have these goals that they're working on and one of the goals they wanted Izzy to work on was her tone and I'm like Okay, I think it's important for Izzy to be aware that she is being perceived as upset or um, confrontational, but it's actually part of autism that we are not aware of our tone. And I want autistic affirming language put in this IEP. I do not want it to be where y'all are expecting Izzy to mask, to appear neurotypical to please a teacher. Um, and so the IP teacher, I think really got that she's new. So she, she's, she's a new one. She wasn't the one we had last year and her eyes actually lit up. She's like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with autism. I was like, awesome. <laughs> so again, the individuals in the system are great. But then she's like, oh, but we have to word this where it's a goal. And, and she has to be able to, to work on this. And I'm like, yeah, so let's say, Izzy needs to be able to communicate with a teacher that her tone may sound like she's upset, but that she isn't, and the teacher needs to believe her. And that Izzy is doing her best to communicate that she needs, because usually she's calling teachers um, to get more direct um, examples. <laughs> for what the teacher's wanting for the assignments because the assignments can be so incredibly vague and autistic people need direct communication. So, um, yeah, it's just been really interesting. And then the, I was talking about, you know, social constructs on threads app and this one lady was kind of in the comments with me and she was talking and, and so I was using instead of trying to talk in a philosophical manner I was like okay let's use the example of tipping you know because I figured that one was not as controversial as some of the other ones and she was like but it you know again it's just how it's always done and then she's like oh maybe you don't understand what tipping is and so she was trying to explain to me and how to use a tipping calculator and I'm like I know how to tip. I know what tipping is. I know <laughs> it's broken. We should not be tipping people left and right all the time. And it's gotten insane. Like someone said that they tip 80% on their meal. Like, why do you think that's okay? It is not okay to tip 80% of your bill. And the higher and higher the tip gets, the corporations that are running these restaurants are getting richer and I'm, not all of them. Again, I know there's a lot of mom and pop restaurants out there. And if they had to pay w living wages, then, you know, they would struggle to stay open. But again, it's just, they need to charge what they need to charge to keep the restaurant open and to pay their staff correctly. And if people can't afford that, then they can't go to that restaurant. Now, food prices is a whole nother system. But yeah, it's a tangled web. It does get complicated. Autistic people are aware that it's complicated, but we also understand that we made these social constructs up as a human humanity. And they are important. They are needed as part of 
living and working together as a society. We have to have social constructs so that we can coexist together, but we also need to realize that when they're broken, we need to come together again as a society and create new ones or change them. They are not, just because something has always been done that way is not an excuse or a good reason to keep doing it that way. Um, yeah, this just will blow my mind over and over that some people really struggle to understand that. Okay, so I'm gonna divert to one other thing because it's very similar. And this one kind of blew my mind also a little bit and it's sort of related. Um, again, it's talking about a social agreement. And I put on the message board on threads that a lot of autistic people are honest. Like it's in our nature to be honest. And again, there are a lot of autistic people because of the way they had to mask growing up if they were not diagnosed early, they actually learned lying as part of their survival. So there's like, and then there's also the tied in of social justice um, that if an autistic person feels that there is a law or a rule that is unjust, then to them, that is not lying about it or, or breaking that rule. That they have a moral obligation to break that rule. Okay, so I am one of the autistic people who is very much a rule follower. And I do see and understand laws that are unjust or that should not exist. And I feel strongly to do the things that you need to do to try to get these laws removed from our system. But one of the social rules that I thought was pretty firm was that stealing was bad. And I understand I come from a very privileged place where I have never um, not had a full refrigerator. So I'm not judging people who are in a place where they are so hungry that they are stealing to find food. I do think that there are other ways, but again, um, that isn't really what I was talking about when I brought this up. I was bringing up, I was seeing people on TikTok and on Facebook and lots of actually social media platforms where they were stealing and bragging about it. And then people in the comments were congratulating them for stealing. And I'm like, why is this a thing? Why are we bragging about stealing? I am so confused. I thought stealing was bad. And like, I thought that was a social agreement that we, theft is not a good thing. I'm not even religious, you know, but like thou shall not steal, right? Um, but apparently there's been a shift in our culture. And again, you know, that's the thing. Social constructs change. And there has been a shift in our culture where there's a big portion of people that I just learned about that feel like stealing is a rebellion. It's a form of rebellion. And that stealing from large corporations is something to brag about. Now, I disagree with this personally. I want big corporations to be held accountable and I want them to pay their taxes and I want them to pay living wages and better than living wages and all of that. Like I feel that corporations are evil and need to be addressed. I don't feel like stealing from them is the answer. But there is a huge people, group of people, and a lot of them were autistic. <sighs> okay, I had to take that phone call. It's from my dentist. Yay. Um, they had to reschedule my appointment and they had it like way out into April, but they had a cancellation, so I get to go in tomorrow. Where was I talking about? Oh yeah, so apparently stealing is now a form of rebellion for a lot of people. And I, from the comment sections, I couldn't tell how many were autistic and how many were allistic. And so this has really got me um, puzzled and confused and uh, befuddled and all of the words uh, because again, and it was funny because when I was talking about this in my comment section, 
people are like, oh, well, and they were trying to catch me because like I, I'm a rule follower in general. I'm, I'm not perfect. And I do follow under that social justice thing is the, like, um, you know, if a rule is broken, like for instance, going back to the IEP, we had to set a goal for our kids. And I, the, the reasoning for that is like, to me, it's stupid, it's broken, it's red tape. So I basically told them a rule, I mean, a, a goal that my kid already could do. Um, so I kind of, you know, broke the rule a little bit in that to give them a goal <laughs> because I don't need the school setting my kids goals, okay? I'm handling that as a parent. I don't need the school to step into that. So, you know, I n shifted that a little bit because I, I think that system is broken, right? So I also will fall into this social justice and bending the rules when it doesn't work. But laws again, like, and so somebody's like, oh, but I bet you speed. And I'm like, well, actually, I've been driving for 28 years. I've never had a moving violation. Um, not never. I had one when I was 16. And it was because I was doing 70 in a 60 because I thought the speed limit was 70. It's not an excuse, but I really thought the speed limit was 70 on that road. Um, but since then, since I was 16, I've never had a moving violation. The only time I speed is when you're going with the um, pace of the traffic. And I, when I real, like, I don't realize I'm speeding, but as soon as I do, I will like go into the slower lane again and like not speed. I just, I don't see a purpose in speeding. And so I thought it was really funny when that person's like, I bet you speed. I'm like, well, you know, you're actually talking to the wrong person, but, um, and again, I'm not trying to call anybody out who does speed. It's just my personal thing. My mom actually had me do the math one time when I, when I was 16. And if you do the math, like literally sit down and calculate if you're going 10 miles over an hour, and blah, blah, blah. like it was a huge math problem. It saved you like 30 seconds at the end. Like it's so not worth it. Anyway, that, that lesson really affected me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so people are out there stealing and bragging about it. And they're saying it's a form of rebellion. And this one is um, not something I'm going to participate in. And I'm not saying that rebellion isn't an effective manner of change. Um, I think I just don't see, see personally that how stealing can be a form of rebellion. I feel like we need to go out of co at corporations in a different path. So I don't agree with the fact that that is rebellion. I think that is, again, a system that's broken. Our corporations are like profiting at insane levels while people are going hungry. And that does need to change. And I don't think stealing from them is going to fix the problem. Like that's a me thing, I guess. Anyway, um, I love talking about these things and brainstorming them. The thing is like, it sucks because they do matter. People's actual lives are affected by these broken systems that we have made up. And I want to live in the world as it should be instead of the world that actually is. And you have to remind yourself, like, you know, that that one person who's like, oh, but you have to tip. And I'm like, I do tip because that's the world I live in right now. And I know that server is only making like $3 an hour and I'm not going to punish this individual server. So I do tip. I, I do. Um, and I also, at the same time, two truths can be true at once. I also think that tipping is broken. And when I have the opportunity, for instance, my hairdresser, um, she sets her own prices. She owns her own business. So I tell her straight up, hey, you charge, um, curly haircuts are very expensive. Um, she charges $85 for a haircut. And I tell her, I, and she sets her own prices. And so I was like, tipping makes me really uncomfortable. How much do you need to get paid? Do you, is $85 enough for you? Or are you expecting me to tip more? And if you are, just tell me what it is and I will pay it. And she <laughs> laughed very uncomfortably the first time I told her this. And I, and I explained it. I was like, I'm autistic. The, it just, it, it's frustrating for me. And I'd rather just you pay you what you need to be a successful businesswoman because I love your services. And she's like, wow, that's amazing. And then, 
you know, she's like, no, the $85 is totally fine. And I'm like, okay. And so I pay her the $85. Um, and that's on her because like I've struck communication with her. If she needed 95 or 100, then she should have told me that. And I've been a customer of hers for years and years and years. And I bring her so much business. Like I feel like I tip her because I recommend her to so many people that she gets so much business off of me. You wouldn't know it because I'm having a really bad hair day today, but <laughs> she's an amazing stylist. Anyway, this video is getting long. This is a subject I am so passionate about and I can talk on for, you know, hours on end, but um, we'll wrap it up. And I look forward to the discussion down in the comment boxes or the comments down below. And so if you'd like to see one of my um, previous videos on social constructs, make sure that you hit this box right here and I'll see you on the next video. Bye guys.